Who has not heard of the favelas? The dictionary translation is slums or sometimes shanty towns. In reality, the first time the term was used was in a district called Canudos. There was a little square there with a tree called a favela. A community grew up around the tree and took its name from it. Ever since, whenever a group of families finds an uninhabited spot and builds houses there, they call it a favela. True story or not, the fact is there are today two million inhabitants of a thousand favelas spread out across the city with no urban planning or politics. Originally, the favelas nobly gave shelter to the poor, and the water that ran down from the mountains was pure. Today, those forest streams run through kilometers of favelas with no purification plants or sanitation. The water that flows into the Bay of Rio is polluted, toxic even. Biologist Mario Moscatelli is a key figure in nature conservation in Rio. Above all, though, he's a fighter. He's the spokesman for all those who, like him, are tired of the city's apathy and the powerlessness of the state. He's funded by residence associations and real estate companies. And once a week, he flies over the bay and the lagoons of Rio to monitor the pollution and denounce the polluters. In the 80s, you could still find 40 different species of fish in this lagoon. But there's just one invasive species left, the tilapia. There used to be hundreds of species of birds, reptiles, mammals. Today, there's hardly five or ten species left. But you do find sofas, TVs, chairs, bodies, anything. It's a real sewer, and there's no more water. It's completely contaminated, not a drop of oxygen. And with all the gases it gives off, the sulfur and the methane, it makes your eyes sting. The smell's unbearable. It stinks. In this 130-hectare area, we've had to install about two kilometers of fencing. I think I must be one of the world's most qualified garbage men. I spend 95% of my time, me, a biologist, stopping rubbish getting into regeneration zones and clearing rubbish out of them. It's my worst enemy right now, the garbage, and the civilization that's producing it all and chucking it into streams and rivers. Observing Rio's ecology since 1997, Mario Moscatelli has seen urban and industrial pollution poisoning ecosystems in the bay, from the lagoons, the marshes, and even the lakes throughout the whole of Rio and its suburbs. Is it irreversible? No, there's hope. In these magnificent virgin forests at the heart of the city, there are still true ecological treasures. It is thanks to these forests that Rio could one day get back to nature. Up there, the forest is nature's barometer. There are species of animals that have been there for more than 25,000 years. The force of nature is still strong. Three point six centimeters. Vinicius is one of the rare urban biologists to take an interest in Rio's surviving animals, like this frog that's only found here on a hundred meter stretch of river deep in the forest. Folklore says that these are magical creatures, but this one looks so small and fragile. Ilosia nasus is endemic to this region. 
Amphibians are the sentinels of the environment. The presence here of this individual indicates that this park has an excellent level of environmental quality, even of the water in the park. In well-preserved areas covered with forest and little streams, the quality of the environment attains a level that favors the presence of these animals. The further down you go in the forest, the more wastewater you find emptying into the rivers. So when you get near the houses, these amphibians tend to disappear. No princess has ever kissed it, but all the same, this little frog, proper name Elosionassus, is still proof of a miracle. There are still many preserved areas from which Rio could regenerate itself. The battle is not lost. The water from the forests arrives in the lagoon polluted, so Mario Moscatelli wants to purify it. But how? By replanting along the shore the mangroves, forests on stilts that live to the rhythm of the tides. They are a veritable biomechanical machine for depolluting the water, a natural way of putting air back into the water. It's important to plant mangroves. Because they're like maternity wards and supermarkets. They're filters. They maintain the diversity of the whole intertropical coastal zone. There are many other ecosystems, such as the coral reefs, but especially on the Brazilian coast, both small and commercial fishermen, as well as ecotourism, all depend on the mangroves. Without them, there'd be no fish, no crabs, practically no biodiversity. In 13 years, with the help of the municipality, Mario's team has rebuilt, plant by plant, 30 hectares of mangrove. Through urbanization, the airport, the embankments, and industrialization, the bay has lost 60% of its surface and is getting dangerously dry. The greatest loss, 35 years ago, was the 130 hectares of mangrove buried beneath the city's Gramacho refuse dump landfill the size of a 130 football stadiums, right next to the city and right on the bay at water level. In 2012, aware of the ecological emergency, the municipality decided to close the dump. But for 35 years, Gramacho, covered these days by a thick coat of soil, accumulated 9,000 tons of waste per day. The closure of the landfill was both a difficult decision and a difficult task. There were 20,000 recyclers, the catadores, working there in nightmarish condition, risking their lives every day amongst the constant trucks and the whims of the bulldozers and rendering the site inaccessible. But after years of false promises, the city of Rio has at last closed Gramacho. It's the first tangible sign of the city's transformation, the beginnings of a political will that took shape only a month before the Earth Summit. Since the closure, most of the recyclers have been encouraged to leave and paid off. Rose, who made her living from the dump, did not want to leave. Along with her husband, she opened a little recycling business. Every day, she stocks up from cast-offs at the shopping centers and here and there in the city, sorting and resorting the waste to sell it on to wholesalers. In two years, she has gone from a horse to a little van and now a truck. These days, she can load a ton of waste every trip and usually recycles 800 kilos of it. Before I worked at the landfill, I didn't know what was polluting and what wasn't what you could or couldn't recycle. We threw stuff around and wasted a lot of it. So I learned to recycle and to think of the environment and nature 
I came to understand a lot about nature, and I'm still learning. We got where we are today thanks to the landfill. Plastic, scrap iron, aluminum, paper, cardboard, glass. Rose and Marco Aurelio sort 20 sacks a day. The plastic sells at 45 euro cents the kilo. Cardboard and paper fetch 25 cents. Their hard work means their children now go to school. To get rid of its 9,000 tons a day of waste, Rio has opened an ultra-modern landfill, this time far from the sea, where the waste is treated in a controlled environment. Two years after the closure, Guanabara Bay is starting to look healthier. People are making a bit of money. They're fishing again, selling fish. That's the power of nature for you. I reckon it's God's helping hand. The closing down of Gramacho has been hailed as the end of a crime against nature. And day by day, nature is reasserting herself, leaving behind the days when she was run out of town. Until the 1970s, uh, Brazilian government was asking companies uh, that produced a lot of pollution in, the, in Europe and uh, I say to come to Brazil because they publish uh, advertisement saying, welcome pollution, we are open for pollution. The policy of excessive development belongs to 20th century history. Today, Rio wants to move into a new era with a new face, a greener soul, and action symbolic of its respect for life.